I'm Richard Gisbert and you're at the Listening Post. This week, the latest YouTube killer. The video that triggered alarm bells in Finland. What message should the media send out? Ramadan nights and a captive Muslim audience. <laughs> the battle for television viewers causes controversy. The media war in Palestine. Brutal discipline used by the Fedayeen Saddam. Old video from Iraq gets a new airing. And put your hands together for the Bee Gees. And our internet video of the week. Welcome back. It's a phenomenon of our time and our technology. The YouTube killer, a solitary young man who murders schoolmates and leaves a blurry video behind on the world's biggest video file sharing site. Aside from the terrible cost in human lives, 10 dead in the latest shooting in Finland, another eight killed there last year, the legacy for the media comes in the form of a videotaped obituary, widely used by news media around the world. But should the media use these images? And what steps are being taken to ensure that YouTube is not used as a platform to glorify criminals and the mentally disturbed? That's our starting point this week. YouTube, the killer videos, and the media. The news was shocking. A deadly school shooting rampage in Finland. Shockingly familiar. Tuesday's attack was Finland's second deadly school shooting in less than a year. Police have also been scouring the internet for clues about the gunman's identity and motives. The latest Finnish school shooter has joined the ranks of a disturbing new breed, young mass murderers who rely on media, both new and traditional, to gain notoriety. The most clicked story is uh, the shooting at the Finnish college. This case was almost a carbon copy of the student who killed eight people in Jokola, Finland last year after posting video of himself on YouTube. I think in terms of the psychological profile of this type of offender, the ability to get the message out to a vast number of people, it gives them a sense of power and control, a feeling of being able to manipulate the audience beyond their death. When Finland suffered its first school shooting, Finns reacted with understandable horror. Their concern was focused not only on the wide distribution of the shooter's material on YouTube, but on why it was that no one had reported the video that he had posted two weeks earlier. The fact that no one did is, of course, also a social psychological phenomenon in that when you see something that you know that thousands of other people do see, you're not very likely to act upon it, even if you think somebody should, but you don't take the responsibility because you feel that, well, somebody else will. This time, somebody did see the videos showing the gunman taking target practice and acted on it. These postings were suspicious enough. Finnish police called him in for questioning, but let him go the day before the killing spree. It's very difficult for the police to police the internet. In reality, they couldn't have predicted that what was expressed on the internet would be translated into the reality of a, a mass murder. The problem is that the internet is a virtual world, making criminals like the first Finnish shooter that much harder to catch. The astonishing thing was, I think, that he had found a group of like-minded people on the internet who supported his ideology, who encouraged him, who even admired him, who made him feel that he was right in what he was planning to do. And after the shootings, the material created for the internet is snapped up by the mainstream news media. On YouTube and set to music, a picture of the school which raises the ethical question, should television news show these videos at all? I actually think that if you ignore them in the media, there's going to be less incentive for them to do what they do. If they think that they're going to kill nine people in a schoolyard and nobody's going to pay attention to them, I think they're less likely to kill nine people in a schoolyard. With regard to some of that video footage... That in a sense, they're fueling the offender's fantasy. But on the positive side, I think they are perhaps serving a purpose in alerting people to the, the dangers of the Internet. And what about YouTube and the question of its responsibility? Should YouTube police itself to a greater degree than the law currently forces the site to? 
and we trust the YouTube community to police it themselves. And it turns out that it's a far more effective way of having millions and millions of people around the world doing it than a handful of people at one private company. Just waiting for users to report it, I don't think is acceptable. I mean, think about it for a minute. If you're interested in violent uh, videos and you go looking for them on a website, you're hardly then going to report it to the company and ask for it to be removed. The whole philosophy behind that idea, I think, is flawed. Having recently reached an agreement in the UK to remove any images that glorify knives or guns, should the site apply that policy worldwide? The difference is that in the UK it's unacceptable, but in another culture it's not. So YouTube is also evolving in terms of in different countries around Europe and the Middle East, what is acceptable and what isn't. You also got to remember YouTube is three years old and you know it's it's evolving, it's learning, and it's becoming increasingly more kind of locally, culturally re relevant. And it's not just YouTube. It took down the shooter's videos as soon as the killings occurred, but there are many other sites where they are still available and still watched. LiveLeak.com is one of them. The people that come to our site, they want to have a choice. They want it to be their choice whether they watch something or not. They don't want someone telling them, oh no, this is far too offensive or far too horrific for you to watch. Because it always begs that question, well, why is the censor still okay? And I accept it is literally impossible. Uh, for these images to be screened before they're put up there. Or it's impossible to do that without changing fundamentally the whole nature of the user experience within it. In the end, it's a question of what people want. How do you become a YouTube gorilla? One of the things users love about the internet is that it's the media equivalent of the Wild West, largely unfettered and unrestrained. But as this new medium becomes the message for the violent and the disturbed, we can expect more and more voices advocating less freedom and more control. But there's always going to be an element of which is bad. And uh, as a society, we have to look at whether we kind of uh, tackle the root causes of that or whether we tackle the reflection of it in the mirror. Some of us don't want nannying. We don't want people to tell us what to think, what to watch, what to say, what to do. And when media is uncensored, it's, it's that personal choice. You've got no one to blame if it's upsetting you because it was your choice to actually seek it out, click on it, and then view it. Here's how our Global Village voices see the school shooting story. It seems to me that uh, policing YouTube uh, wouldn't really take away the, uh, the, the motivations for those people uh, who did those shootings. They were obviously looking for some kind of publicity. Uh, if it wasn't YouTube, it would be some other form. I love YouTube because it's all about freedom of expression. The video was actually flagged by the community and the police were contacted. He was questioned 24 hours in advance. So if the police had done their job right, YouTube would have directly aided in the rehabilitation of this guy and saved the lives of Finnish school students. These people will find a way to get their message across. And I doubt that the blame should be on the media or the video sharing sites. If a nail gets hit by a hammer, don't blame the hammer. It's the person holding the hammer who's responsible. And I think that putting the blame on video sharing sites like YouTube or the media is an oversimplified explanation to these school shootings. We're always on the lookout for more Global Village Voices and their take on the state of the global media. Just email us at listeningpost at aljazeera.net and we'll find a way via webcam or even camera phone to get your voice on the air. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The media war continues in the Palestinian territories, and the latest incident shows how far one side is willing to go to discredit the other. A video recently aired on Palestinian TV, the channel controlled by Fatah, purported to show Hamas's policemen in Gaza terrorizing their opponents, in some cases throwing them off buildings. But it turns out that the video was actually filmed in Iraq and first aired back in 2003 on CNN, which called it evidence of Saddam Hussein's security forces brutalizing civilians. Al-Aqsa TV, which is controlled by Hamas, put what it called the real story on its air, saying it wanted to expose the lie to Palestinian and Arab audiences. The police in Gaza have threatened to sue Palestinian TV over the incident, although they say they don't really expect to get justice through the courts. An Egyptian court has upheld a guilty verdict against a newspaper editor who wrote stories suggesting that President Hosni Mubarak's health was failing. 
Ibrahim Issa, editor of the Daily Al Dastur, was given a reduced sentence of two months in jail. He was originally convicted in March and given six months on charges of reporting and publishing false information about the health of the 80-year-old president. Many in the Egyptian press and the blogosphere ran with the rumors about the president's health after he had stayed out of the public eye for a while. His wife eventually quashed the stories by telling the nation on TV that her husband was okay. <laughs> Italy is still trying to deal with the fallout of a court case from earlier this year, which some Italian politicians now suggest means that internet weblogs are in fact illegal. The story started in Sicily where a judge ruled that the author of a blog on the links between police and the mafia there was guilty of what under Italian law is called stampa clandestina, essentially publishing a clandestine newspaper. Recently, a member of the Italian parliament told the country's justice minister that the court ruling meant that the entire internet is illegal. The judge in the case based his ruling on a law that was passed back in 1948 in the aftermath of Italy's fascist period when the government wanted to regulate partisan and extremist newspapers. People advocating freedom on the internet are now arguing that the Italian government should change the law to eliminate any confusion over the legality of the net there. When the Wall Street bank and insurance collapses put economic issues at the forefront of the U.S. presidential election campaign, Republican candidate John McCain famously and symbolically suspended his campaign in order to, as he put it, focus on the crisis. I should be doing whatever little I can to help this process. The media had their doubts about McCain's real motivations. Many suspected they were political, not economic. But the tiny Keen Sentinel, a newspaper in the U.S. state of New Hampshire, may have summed up the story best with an editorial. It read, we have decided to suspend our editorial activities today so we can adequately ponder the implications of the economic bailout program. Sometimes it takes a small newspaper to make a point that some larger publications ought to make. We're back after the break with a story on Ramadan TV, the biggest money spinner on Arab television.